Hello. Welcome to another episode of the Purple Evolution Podcast. Today we have Dave Myers who works in the foster care system. He says there is a lot of crossover between the left and right in that community, and it has remained pretty civil because both sides of the aisle believe in the good of the family. We hope you find this educational and interesting and learn a little bit about the foster care system and how politics play a part in it. Enjoy. Martin Luther King championed the civil rights movement. This is the right to be civil movement. Y'all want to know who you voted for? So they can let you in or show you the door. She votes left and he votes right. It's a hell of a recipe for a holiday fight. From our recording studio in Castleberry, Florida, and our production house in Coral Springs, you're listening to the Purple Evolution Podcast. My name is Doug Halper, and with your permission, I will be your guide on a journey through all things purple regarding the coexistence of human beings on this wonderful planet we call home. The creator of the Purple Evolution, my friend and our host, is Armand Della Volpe, who for over 40 years has been dedicated to being a stand for love. Along with his bride, Angelina, Armand has stood true to this commitment through the mediums of public speaking, performing songwriter, TV and radio appearances, magazine and book publishing, personal counseling, and now the world of podcasting. Please help me welcome my favorite civil servant, or more aptly put, servant for civility, Armand. Yeah. All right. Here we are. (laughs) Interview with a a whole new energy on the Purple Evolution podcast. Um, Excited. I'm going to learn a lot of stuff about, you know, the whole foster care system, which is interesting because uh, uh, I talked to Angelina a few times and thought, well, I I don't want to have any bio kids. But uh, I've been a big brother, and uh, and I thought that would be kind of a cool thing to do. Maybe like at sixty five years old, is uh, is take somebody in and uh, and be a foster parent. You know, uh, I just thought that would be kind of cool, even if it was a temporary, because a lot of times you just do a temporary fostering until they're placed with a full time home, and uh, that just did not resonate at all with my bride. And so it just kind of came and went. So it's going to be interesting to hear about somebody who's in the system and, uh, and how it works and, uh, you know, how, how politics is affected by it. So uh, I'm excited to learn about him. Cool. So let me ask you this. If, if Angelina had said, yeah, what age do you think would uh, you be most interested in? Not necessarily her, but you. Me, I would say four to 10 kind of like the uh, range okay range for me that's younger than i expected you to say a four-year-old in your house i'd love it oh my god well i've had uh i've had a few uh i've had i've dated two different women that had three and four year old children and uh it was a blast uh until we broke up (laughs) (laughs) that's that's always the part that's not such a blast, isn't it? <laughs> not such a yeah. blast, yeah. I think I would go with the, um, I don't know. I think I would probably go with the 10 or 11 uh, age just because that was, um, I shouldn't say this on the air, but I'm going to. That was always my favorite age in when I was teaching elementary school were the, the fifth graders because they were at that age where a, a lot of them were not yet, they, they, were, they were old enough to have, real meaningful conversations, you know, about life, but a lot of them had not gotten too cool for school yet. Uh, Some of them had for sure. Um, But a lot of them hadn't, and they were 
uh, of course, in the TV studio with me. And anything I asked them to learn, I mean, boom, they picked it up instantly. You know, they were working all the teleprompters and the, um, the video switchers and the sound equipment, running a Mackie, 12 channel Mackie board, no problem. Um, they just love that stuff. And everything is an exploration and everything is looked at upon with wonder you know wow yeah so i love that age i, I can it. i can see that and what a blessing that you got to do that because uh <sighs> you know we we all get a chance to parent in weird ways either as aunts and uncles or uh teachers or in my case stepdads and things like that so uh yeah 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 no it was you're right so okay so today it's dave myers dave uh has been a viewer and listener for gosh since the beginning of our podcast and can you believe we just hit 25 podcasts? This is number 26 that we're doing today. Kind of cool. Wow, that's Kinda a half cool. a year. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, yeah, it is. And um, anyway, so he's been with us since the beginning, and he's been loving what we're after since the beginning, what you created, Armand, uh, a number of years ago. And um, he's with us today, and we've already done the interview. I want to read just a little bit about him. I have a bio here um, that I thought really... Uh, summed it up pretty nicely. So I'm going to go ahead and just read it. Uh, his name is Dave, Dave Myers. He's an attorney who serves as the CEO of Dependency Legal Services, a nonprofit that holds contracts to represent parents and children in eight Northern California, California, California counties. In addition, he serves as part-time staff to the UC Davis Northern Training Academy and runs the law offices of David Myers. He has been working in the field of juvenile dependency law since 95, and he has been a lawyer for upwards of three decades now, and, and he's, he's gone through it all. He went through the divorce uh, law, he went through the bankruptcy law, and anyway, one thing led to another, and he fell into the foster care system. That's, that's how he ended up here. Uh, he served for many years as the senior attorney with the Center for Families, Children, and the Courts where his primary responsibility included curriculum development and training facilitation for other attorneys and court professionals who are engaged in the juvenile dependency practice. Uh, and he is licensed to practice law in California, Arizona, and the Pasqua Yaki Nation. Uh, hmm. Let's see, yeah. Um, Dave was an assistant attorney general in Tucson, representing the Child Protective Services Division. Uh, he worked for Sacramento Child Advocates and for many years served as the super, supervising attorney of parent advocates of Sacramento, where he was responsible for the representation of indigent parents in child welfare cases. He's currently a member of the American Bar Association's Parent Attorney Representation Project Steering Committee, that's a mouthful, where he works to advance attorney representation issues throughout the country. Uh, he does hold his bachelor's in journalism and music from, wait for it, wait for it, the University of Florida. Go Yay. Gators! Woo. Go Gator Band! Go Canes! Oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't see that on here. And his JD from the University of Arizona. Uh, he is the former music critic for his hometown newspaper uh, and plays piano in a Sacramento area club. So that's Dave Myers. And when I... Um, first asked him well actually I, I asked the question to all of our viewers and he was the one that contacted us and said I want to be involved in this and he says I know a lot of people and I work in an industry um, that has a lot of crossover between the left and the right between the red and the blue politically in our country he says this is an industry where everybody is after what's best for the children and parents what's best for the families and he says it's really neat to see all these different people working together uh in situations where otherwise they might be fighting a lot like you see on the news so anyway uh very exciting he contacted us and says i want to be involved and we started talking to him and found out that he had an enormous amount like i said three decades worth of information um on just that so he likes to talk purple uh he loves being purple and uh, anything else you want to say, Armand, before we uh, roll, roll our interview? 
uh, a couple of quick things. So often we talk about stuff uh, that shines light on the polarity of our nation and how we can be part of the solution. And it's nice to have a discussion about something that is already doing a, a bipartisan kind of uh, attitude towards something. The other thing is when I heard you say 26 episodes, my brain immediately went to, oh, 26 Mondays, that's half a year. But the truth is we only do it every second Monday. And, and uh, you know, number one and number three. So really it's almost a year of episodes doing two a month. So uh, it's more exciting to have a, almost a year under our belt than, uh, than a half a year. Absolutely. And I was thinking that when you said that, I thought, ah, maybe my math's off today, but you're right. <laughs> so, okay. So Dave Myers, let's roll the tape. Hey. Hey, dude. <laughs> Arman. Dave. Hi, David. Dave Arman. Hi, Dave. Uh, you're putting my background to shame. I need to put some. <laughs> I need <to> get some... <laughs> Simplicity yeah, is, a, is a divine thing, my friend. <laughs> it's nice to meet you, Armand. Nice to meet you too, Dave. David is uh, works in in the foster care system, and mm. Dave, you've mentioned um, that you think that there's a lot of crossover between the left and the right in that particular community. And in our last half hour, you told me that. Uh, it's the it's one of the areas that in the last four years really hasn't um it's remained a pretty civil area and that people really are trying to do what's best for the families um even though uh administration has changed in the white house it hasn't really affected the area as much and it's stayed pretty sane. one of the things i like that you said was that both sides of the aisle seem to be interested in in the good of the families, and um, so if you can talk, to, just talk about about your area, man, and what you've seen, and how you think politically it's been affected, and um, where the left is, where the right is, where the purple is. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think first of all, we all bring a certain level of expertise to this field because we were all children, and we were all raised by people. Um, and so a lot of those experiences are, are common in terms of for the, it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on if you were raised by uh, if you had a special grandparent or aunt or cousin who was maybe maybe the one you were literally raised with um, or just someone who was really close to you and so it's, it's not hard to find connection when people talk about their experiences growing up and then the good and bad and the ugly because we were all children and now as, as policymakers and, and leaders become parents and grandparents, again, those experiences cut across lines. If you have a developmentally delayed child, for example, um, you're going to have a certain experience with that child that's gonna cut across lines because you're gonna experience government, you're gonna experience the school systems, you're gonna experience healthcare systems um, in a way that, um, again, is, is just not political, it's, it's your life, it's your family. And then of course, children themselves, children don't vote. Um, children don't have super PACs. Um, children don't have lobbyists for the most part. Um, and so, you know, there's this kind of universal toward it. And, and what I th think is really fascinating about the field is that um, this notion of protecting children um, is a fairly universal, we can all agree um, that if there are people out there who are abusing children, physically abusing or God forbid, sexually abusing children. Um, we wanna protect those children. And there's really no disagreement among anyone that a child in danger like that, um, we as a society feel some obligation to go and protect that child. Um, what's fascinating about my field is that um, we deal with abuse and neglect and abuse cases account for about less than 20% of what we do. So while we can all agree on child abuse, like child abuse is a bad thing. Um, you're never gonna hear anybody on either side of the aisle say, um, let's not help protect children that are being abused. Um, where it gets more fascinating and really where the, the nuances come in is, is in neglect. Because we've come over the last, this is a very new field. Um, we didn't have government child protection until the early 1970s. Mm. Um, you know, it was really as a result of kind of the, the civil rights movement 
um, and Congress opened up the money um, by amending Title IV E of the Social Security Act um, that allowed for federal reimbursement of children who come into foster care. That happened in the late 1960s. Um, and there's a long and storied history that led up to that. Um, but this field that we're in of, of government as child protective agent, um, that didn't really start until the late 1960s, early 1970s. So we're a very new field and a very young field and we're still learning about what safety really means um, and, and what neglect really means. And so really what we've seen in the 80s, 90s and now, all the way through now is substance abuse. Um, and when we deal with families who are using, abusing substances, how do we help those families? And when you think about that, um, it's, it fascinates me because um, I think all of us in this world have some connection to someone who struggles with addiction, um, whether it's a friend, whether it's someone in our own family. Um, and if you think about how the person in our own life is struggling with addiction, now imagine if that person had a child, um, which is not hard to imagine when, in a lot of situations and, and how we as a society feel either an obligation or no obligation. Um, and then when it comes to the point where, wow, this is so severe that government needs to step in, um, that's where the debate really begins. Um, and we see most of our cases involve substance use or substance abuse um, and, and domestic violence as well. Um, you know the stats on domestic violence in terms of one out of every four women will, will encounter domestic violence in their life. So our field, the real work in our field, again, with, we do real well with abuse. Um, we, we do real well. We, we all pull in the same direction. We're all rowing in the same direction when it comes to abuse. Um, we sometimes and, and quite often have discussions about what is neglect, what is safety, and at what point should the government come in? And if you're on the right side of the aisle, if you're a Republican, your general take is we don't really want government coming into private homes and taking kids away from families. Um, that's really not the business of government. Um, you know, keep your laws, you know, we don't, we don't really, almost like a gun control argument, like, hey, I have a right to do this. I have a right to raise my kid um, and you shouldn't be stepping in. Um, and then if you go to the left side of the aisle, um, you know, liberals will tend to say, yeah, I really want to help. I really want to come in and help this family. How can we help this family? But the meaning of the word help gets lost. Well, I want to help because, well, this kid will be better off in a, in a foster home that's a, in a little better neighborhood. Or this, you'll be, you know, you need to be completely clean and sober before you can take care of these kids. And so you get this, these tensions that develop um, that are not typical. And, and the examples I always give, um, in the mid 90s, the, the feds passed a law called the Adoption and Safe Families Act, um, which was of course passed during the Clinton administration and, and Hillary was actually a lead driver of this law, which basically says you have to cut off families. Um, you have a certain amount of time to reunify. If we take your kid and put the kid into foster care, you only have a certain amount of time, 15 out of 22 months to reunify. And if not, we got to adopt your kid out. Um, wow. Right, which is this very conservative notion passed by very liberal people. Um, and what we're seeing 25 years later is a lot of children of color um, are disproportionately being adopted over, you know, a lot of, of white children. And so we're starting to take a look. There's a law pending right now in Congress that is starting to take a look at, boy, what, what did we do 25 years ago when we passed that law? Conversely, if you go into the early 2000s, um, there was a law passed called Family Fostering Connections. And the Fostering Connections Act opens up new money, um, which is not new anymore, having been around for a number of years, um, to help find families. Um, and so it was kind of a, a spending bill to bring in more resources to help these families pass during the Bush administration. Um, and so it was a fairly liberal bill. Um, and so what you have is this, again, this odd convergence of, of conservative and liberal all talking together to try to find solutions for families and where the strange bedfellows really arise um, can be absolutely fascinating and absolutely it's when when you started this podcast um, my heart jumped um, a thousand beats because it's it's exactly what is needed and if if you just slow down 
and just really talk about what's going on in any given moment, in any given situation, you realize that, that the convergence of issues, and I see it every day in my own work, is, is truly purple. And, and you can truly find the common ground to talk about what we need in any given moment or any given issue. And like I said, I, my experience in the foster care system is, is completely congruent with that principle. That is so affirming that there are organizations and uh, movements and things like that where you can talk the way you're talking, where everybody comes into the game. Everybody's got skin in the game. Everybody right. wants something that's going to work uh, for the group. And my hunch is there's probably a lot more of that than we talk about, but the ones that gets the noise uh, is uh, children at the border. Uh, right. That way, one side can demonize the other and vice versa. Or abortion, one side can demonize the side. Uh, or uh, sex trafficking that is only done by liberals in Hollywood. That <laughs> Tom Hanks is the head of that. You know? And t Tom Hanks is, wears red, red shoes. Okay. <clears throat> right, you're exactly right. And we've been putting children, you know, we've been, not, we've been taking children away from their families for 30 years now, or 40 years, 50, however. Um, my math, not so good, <laughs> but um, that you're exactly right. Um, and, you know, our notion of should we be in the business of helping families? And I will say um, a couple of years ago, a federal law passed called um, Families First. And it's really the first money that's going into prevention and preventative services. Um, it was one of, the, one of the criticisms from both sides of the aisle is that, you know, we don't spend money to prevent we only spend money in reaction to, um, but this bill will hopefully lead to some prevention. And we've now been able to quantify over the years, the cost savings in terms of prevention. There have been some studies done that look at if you really invest in the front end, do you save over the, over the back end? And, and the answer is yes. And it's been proven um, in a couple of really key studies that some really smart researchers have done in, in my field over the years. And so that money has now been free to do that. And it's, it's a notion that everybody can get behind. Um, again, if, if we put the money up, up front, because this, this foster care to prison pipeline that we were seeing for so many years, um, because so many prisoners have their own history of abuse or neglect, their own trauma history. So if we can try to catch that earlier, you know, the cost savings just multiply over the years. And so that's, that's a good way to look at it in terms of can we all get behind that notion? And so in this world that we currently live in, that's the prevailing wisdom. And that's part of why, Doug, when you're introducing how we've been able to kind of stay stable is because we've been able to invest some preventative dollars and really think about us as a preventative service um, to try to strengthen families, which is really what we're trying to do. What does prevention look like? Yeah, that's a great question. And so, um, in our country, we have mandated reporters all over, typically your school personnel and hospital personnel and law enforcement. Um, and so a lot of families intersect with our system and that's their gateway is through one of those mandated reporters. Um, anyone can call a child abuse hotline. And so occasionally we get neighbors and of course, often we get exes and we have to deal with that, um, you know, which is sometimes valid, sometimes not. We have to sort through that. Um, but through Arman, those gates, calls me all the time about his exes. I'm like, dude, I'm the wrong number. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> there you go. And so when, when a family comes in through that point of entry, um, typically, you know, in this, it, we are now moving toward a system where we can identify, in fact, the federal law actually literally says that we have to make reasonable efforts to prevent or eliminate the need for removal. And so if you think about what reasonable efforts can we make to prevent or eliminate the need for removal, a lot of time it's supportive services. Sometimes with older kids, it's let's get what we call wraparound services. Let's get some people in the home who are experienced dealing with these issues. Sometimes it's medical, sometimes it's mental health. Um, a lot of times it's addiction. And um, can we get some treatment to this family and leave the family intact? Um, and we're still learning. Um, there's this, this way of practicing social work that is still evolving um, in terms of how we intervene. And, and if you just look at addiction itself, um, 
if you've known anyone who, who was struggling with addiction 20 years ago versus today, um, how we, we look at it is so radically different. Um, the science is really progressing in, in such a good way. And so child welfare goes right along with that in terms of what does prevention mean? Sometimes it's just bringing in a safety network. Sometimes it's just, sometimes it's, it's making peace with your neighbors um, and your family members who have been disconnected because you now the addiction and the disease cut off the relationship. Um, and so just trying to repair that relationship to give that extra level of support means we don't have to take your child out of the home. Um, we can leave your child there because now you know, your sister is gonna be able to take the child to school so you can get to your program in the morning. That may be as simple as that. Um, and yet we still deal with this world where social workers like police officers, um, you know, have this tremendous power and they can come in and they can remove children. Um, and every state gives a social worker the authority to remove a child from the home. Um, and of course they have to justify that. And there's a court process designed to hold them accountable for that. Um, but what that might look like in any given state in any given moment um, is absolutely can be very subjective. And so, um, you know, I, I don't want to paint the rosy picture that, hey, we're, we're all you know, doing great because on any given day, any given moment, um, you know, if you look online, you see, you know, the, the tragedies and the stories and um, you see it on Netflix now. And, um, you know, those are all real too. And, you know, when you deal with humans, you're dealing with human judgment and human error and, and human subjectivity. What percentage of intervention is because of substance abuse? Oh, I would say the statistics show upwards from anywhere from 60 to 80 to higher percent. Um, vast, vast um, issue in child welfare, substance abuse. So, uh, so my next question is when I ask about what does prevention look like, does prevention ever go before intervening? Does it, does it put uh, programs in place to um, help train families in the first place or help folks avoid substance abuse in the first place or is that just is that too esoteric and, and too early to try to to you know is that high in the sky thinking both um, is the answer it is both <laughs> esoteric and very real and the policymakers out there are having these exact discussions how can you know the mandatory screening i think you the, the the easy answer you hear in the meetings is screening let's screen school children to see if there's substance use going on in the home and if there is let's get in there and, and try to help um and you know it's a, we're in a world where that's you know legal whether it's alcohol or marijuana in many states or prescription medication um you know so it's 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 a tricky balance between using what is legal versus abusing. Um, and so, and again, we get into the subjectivity, um, but absolutely um, in terms of where do we wanna go in terms of prevention and treatment and then reaction. Because even when we do remove a child from the home and it starts this time clock running um, with, with some only with very limited exception, we're still trying to help the family. Um, and so it's like, and then as the lawyer, my job is often to tell clients, now's the time. <laughs> if ever there was a time to deal with the issues, it's now because a year from now or six months from now, I don't want to be standing here saying you're going to lose your kid forever. And when I first meet a client, that's what I say to them. I'm here because you could lose your kid forever. And I never want to have that conversation with you. So let's talk about how we can work today so that we don't get to that day. That is wonderful. You know, um, there was a lady running for president a while back, uh, Mary Ann Williamson. Sure. And uh, I happen to be a big fan of hers, met her a few times. I just liked, uh, I liked her angle, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of whether she had any chance. And, she, and somebody said, you know, why politics? You know, you're supposed to be spiritual. And she said, politics is life. And when I hear you talking, you're not talking like uh, somebody – uh, armchair quarterback, uh, you're actually in there. You're, you're in there. You're finding a way to use politics f for your mission. And I think that's what it's ideally designed for. It's, it's become this theoretical thing that we argue about versus 
what you're talking about, how can I use politics and government to make the world a better place for these kids and these families? That, that is more people like you we need. Oh, I'm not so sure about that, but thank you. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's really true. And I think, you know, government is that which we all agree to do. Um, and so we have made a decision, you know, we've made certain decisions in this country, free and public education. Um, you know, protect and serve with fire, um, which used to be privatized and now it's public. Um, and so with, with child welfare and foster care, we've made that decision to invest in, in helping families um, and strengthening families. And again, what I love about that is that it cuts across party lines because when we do it well, we produce cost savings and tax paying citizens, which is, you know, a lot of people love. And we produce these healthy, intelligent, contributing members, you know, the kids that I represent are brilliant. Um, all of them, every single child I represent is this like magic. And it makes it very hard for me because so many of them get lost and you see the lights go out as they hit adolescence. And then they, they go from sad kid to bad kid. Um, and then they grow up and become neglectful parents. Um, and you see these cycles repeat. And so trying to break those cycles is so difficult, um, but we are getting better at it. Uh, we are learning so much and how we take what we've learned and apply that. Um, foster care cuts across about 2% of the population. Um, and it's always the poorest 2% and the disproportionality numbers are in. And so if, if for example, if, if your general population in the city is 10% African-American, your foster care population will be at least 20% African-American. We see this, these are, these are not debatable facts anymore. And so the, what is debatable is how do we invest so that we can serve? Um, and that's where, that's where the, the theory is still evolving and we're still trying to figure it out. And every day we try something new and some work and some don't. Well, since serve and protect is no longer on the side of police cars, which I understood from another one of our viewers, uh, now it yeah. just says enforce law. Uh, Y'all can start using that with the foster care program, serve and protect. It's yeah. available. <laughs> and social workers themselves, and I'm married to a social worker, um, they are these amazing people with, with huge hearts and truly want to help. And they come in with their own agendas. You know, Remember, nobody gets into a helping profession to help others. Um, and so all of us in this helping profession, you know, we, we bring our own agendas. When we're able to recognize that, when we're able to own it um, and own our biases and truly talk about you know, the families in front of us or the issues before us, you know, good things can happen. And I've, I've seen it from both sides of the aisle. Um, and I, I would hate for this issue to be politicized. Uh, um, and it's, it's hard to do that though, because it really does cut across the aisle. And we, we've seen even in the last four years when things have become more politicized than ever, um, we've stayed Knockwood a bit immune to that um, to a large degree. As a bit of an optimist, uh, oh, go ahead, Doug. No, no, no. Oh, as, as a real Pollyanna optimist, I would like to make an, uh, an adjustment to what you said. Uh, just tell me if this resonates. Nobody goes into uh, social programs and stuff like that only to help others, because I know that they do go in to help others as well as bring in their agenda in. I just wanted to throw that out. <laughs> Sure, absolutely. Before, before uh, well you said. respond, Dave, my question was the same thing. My question was, could you say more about that? That was a very curious statement that you made. Nobody goes into a helping profession to help others. I know that there was a lot more behind that. Could you speak to that? Well, I'm not sure we want to spend time talking about my own therapy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's when we start charging anyway. <laughs> <laughs> But it's really true, you know, I mean, uh, our own experiences that drive us and, and motivate us into certain fields and to stay in fields, um, you know, really comes from our own childhood experiences and, and our own, as our templates are being formed in early childhood and, and where we put priorities um, and where we learn our senses of, of right and wrong and, and justice. And so how that you know, carries us forth. I mean, each individual has their own story about how they wound up where they are. I um, mean, when we look critically at that, you know, we start to see the patterns develop and we start to see um, what, what fuels us. 
uh, I'm going to equate that to, I, you know, I've heard a lot of people say you don't do anything nice for other people uh, selflessly. It's always selfish because when you do something nice for other people, it makes you feel good. And that's really why we're doing it because we want to feel yeah. good. And so that's kind of where I went with that. Um, I'm looking at the time. I want to oh. respect your time. we got 13 minutes here before your next call. Tell us a little bit about either A, uh, your nonprofit, and um, specifically uh, who you serve and um, about your nonprofit, or B, anything else you want to talk about on this subject before we have to end the call. <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you both, and please keep doing what you're doing, guys. It's it's incredible and, and so needed. Um, <clears throat> so I um, co-run Dependency Legal Services, um, which is a nonprofit that represents children who are taken into the foster care system and their parents. And we have various divisions and walls that allow us to represent the whole family. Um, and we serve families in eight Northern California counties. Um, and we also you know, work nationally and, and locally and, um, on a varying number of policy issues because um, my partner and I have been in this field for a really long time. Um, and so we are connected to certain networks that, that deal with these issues on, on a number of levels. And, you know, I, I kind of fell into this field because um, I just said yes to everything. You know, as opportunities came along, oh, yeah, we could try that. We could do that. Sure, we could do that. And then you just meet these people along the way um, and you connect and, and the opportunities come. So I've been very lucky to be able to do that. I'm very fortunate to be in this field that I love so much um, and have watched evolve over the years and, and continue to do that. Um, and so I feel very fortunate. And there are a, a vast number of people in this country who work in child welfare and the foster care system. Um, and every single one of them um, is qualified to have a discussion like this in terms of what goes on with children and families um, at this level when you, when you reach a point where things are not healthy um, in a given home to the point where we need to talk about intervening into that family to create some health and safety for children and of course for their parents too. Because um, what I always say is today's parents were yesterday's children. Um, and so again, with the breaking cycles, um, and so, um, you know, I'm very fortunate to be a part of this vast network of folks around the country, whether you, and the people who work in this field, a lot of them are mental health professionals, social workers, um, you know, behavioral experts, education experts, lawyers, judges, and some of the judges that, that we work with are just the most passionate, incredible people, um, that you want to meet and, um, seeing people, across party lines. Um, you know, I, I kind of want to tell you the Montana story real quick. I, I went to Montana to teach a workshop of parents attorneys and I was really scared um, because it was uh, an interdisciplinary workshop. I was told judges would be in the room and I was terrified um, because I thought it was going to be a room of parents attorneys who were really on the side of the parents and their families and justice. Um, and I had this image in my head that I would get there and there would be this judge in the back of the, of the room with a bolo tie and a cowboy hat um, who would just sit there with their arms folded like mm, the whole time. And I get there and that reality came true. Um, and in the back of the courtroom, the entire time was this judge with a bolo hat and a, and a bolo tie and a cowboy hat. And he just sat there with his arms folded the entire time. And I, I'm doing my thing. I have my shtick. I'm telling my jokes. And in the back of my mind, this whole time is like, they're never, ever going to invite me back to Montana again, because he's going to tell everyone like this crazy guy from California spewing all this garbage. He raises his hand at the very end of, of the workshop. And I'm terrified. And I knew he was a judge because someone had tipped me off. I said, Your Honor, please. And out of his mouth came the most supportive, beautiful, couldn't have said it better myself, comment about serving children and families. I, I, was, I was in tears, I was touched. And I said, that's the last word of this workshop because I could not have said it better than myself. And afterwards I went up to him and he was you know, two feet taller than I was. And I said, your honor, I am so grateful that you were here and what you said, I, it was so perfect. And were you thinking that the whole time, <laughs> right? And he's, you know, and he just, he looked down at me because he was a foot taller. 
Um, and he said, you know, there is a way to serve these children and families that we can all get behind. And I'll never forget that. Um, and so you, you just never know. And that's, that's part of what keeps me going. Beautiful. You know, one of the, one of the concepts that we promote taking it from a red versus blue to a red and blue is humility. And uh, you're swim, you're swimming in that, my friend. It's beautiful to see. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, you said you don't. And I'm, I'm grateful for it. when I saw the. Yeah, I'm sorry. Kate. What was that? You said you don't yeah, know when, if the world needs saw... more people like you, but the world does need more people like you because <laughs> you you emanate love while still being in a place of. Um, um, I mean, you're a lawyer, so you're dealing with civil issues uh, on a very real basis, but you're coming from your heart and you're looking for how's the best way you can handle this for everyone's needs to be met. And that is what's needed more in our country, I believe. Oh, thank you guys. Um, when I saw Doug's post, I'm like, oh, I got to get involved with this. And Great. thank you for giving me the opportunity to do it because... Um, your mission is, is, is so desperately needed. I'll do anything I can to support it. Well, I'm Thank just, you. I'm, selfish, I'm selfishly grateful that we just got to catch up too. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Me it too, best. man. It's time, it's time for a visit. Yeah. All the best. Keep, keep doing what you're doing, friend. Thank yeah. you, Armand. It was a pleasure. And I'll, I'll, I'll keep listening. Right, and you make sure you tell, uh, give Tom my love. I surely will. Yeah. I surely will. All right. All right take care, guys. Anytime. Thanks, buddy. All right. Bye. Okay. Bye, bye. Oh. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> uh, I feel like I need to do a, a, a commercial. Thanks. I needed that. You know, I, I, I'm so. I could have had a Dave Myers. Yeah. I'm so <laughs> optimistic about things and I'm so excited about promoting what we do. Uh, but truthfully, a lot of times it's very challenging to be so involved in politics and to see so much out there that is polarized, that it's extra joyous to hear mostly everybody on the same page looking for what's best for the kids. I know there's a few nuances and stuff, but yeah, that uh, that's very uplifting and it's, it's a good shot in the arm for me. You know, I, yeah. I like I like what he said. Uh, government is that which we agree to do. And, uh, and, and right. I, I, when he said that, I thought, yeah, uh, right along the line of Marianne Williamson, which we talked a little bit about, um, she said, politics is life. And what I would like to say relative to what he said, uh, government is that which we agree to do ideally, because um, when we all agree on something, uh, like infrastructure and 80% to 90% of America is behind it, but Congress doesn't do anything about it. Well, our government is not really doing what we agreed to do as right. a country, but yeah, right. ideally he's, he's a real idealist uh, and, and that's good. He is. And yet he's in a profession that has to be action oriented. So it's really quite interesting. Uh, and he, I've called him a peacekeeper before, you know, and he always laughs at that and, and, and says it's his codependency, but really he is. He's a peacekeeper that is in action. Like you said during the interview, you know, he's not being an armchair quarterback. He's in the thick of it. And I mean, lawyers have a lot of power, you know, uh, and they determine, you know, essentially they're determining uh, how to interpret the law. And when it comes to foster care, that could be, um, you know, a judge can decide, hey, this child's not going to be in this house any longer. That's a big deal, which actually comes to the questions that we asked, asked some of our, uh, our listeners. I wanted to say that one of the most interesting things I thought he talked about um, was the neglect. You know, when he said everybody agrees on abuse, but not everybody agrees on the neglect portion of it, which is a, the, the majority. Abuse is easy. But there's so much neglect out there that it overpowers almost the abuse and it's harder to define. And let's see, I wrote some notes here um, that I was comparing it to, you know, everybody, everybody wants guns to be used safely. 
but what does gun safety look like? That's going to be different from the red or the blue. Obviously, everybody wants them to be used safely. Um, nobody wants to kill a baby. Nobody wants to kill a baby. But at what point of fetus development is it considered killing? See, so there's nuance there. And the other one I wrote down was uh, everybody wants to help others in need. Everybody wants to help people in need. Hello, it just makes you feel good. But where is the line between a helping hand and enabling? And it's really interesting that the left proposed some conservative ideas in the foster care system that he was giving us examples of and the right proposed more liberal ones. So... Yeah. And, and when he was talking about that, he was talking about the Clinton administration and the GW administration. And, you know, in hindsight, those two administrations seem so much purple, much more purple than we've had in the last 12 years uh, relative to that. And it's, it's the whole idea. I'll add another one that's kind of a, a piggyback. Um, everybody can agree on we do not want children neglected. But the left and the right will have different ideas about how much the government should be involved in making sure children aren't neglected. And so I, I think it's a, that's just one really good example that we need a left and a right wing for the bird to fly well. It's right in alignment with uh, what we're doing, mm -hmm. my friend. So I know that this is the wrong episode. We're, this should be on the movie episode, which is still yet to come. Uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the movie Gone Baby Gone with Casey Affleck. And there was a point in it when, boy, I'm going to, uh, uh, what do they call it? Spoiler alert, spoiler alert. Leave the room for two minutes if you haven't seen Gone Baby Gone. Um, there was a point in it when they were discussing this child that had been illegally taken away from the parent, the mom, but the mom was really treating the child in a way that she was not going to have a very good life. And it was obvious that she was going down a bad road, but it wasn't legal to take away the child and the child had been taken away. And so there was debate on whether the child should be brought back to the mother to have probably a pretty poor life or kept in the custody of some really great people who wanted to treat this child with so much love and respect and honor and nurturing. Um, so that was, it was a very interesting, you know, do I do the wrong thing if it's even for the right reason kind of thing? Tough. Yeah, that is tough. You know, uh, for some reason, the, the, I haven't seen that yet. And we'll talk later about you know what types of movies I like and don't, if that's a movie I should watch. Um, but I'm thinking of Kramer versus Kramer. You know, it it won all these big awards, and I don't remember uh, what was up against it, but I liked all the other movies better. And uh, people, I said, it, it was the most boring movie I've ever seen. And, and people were like, boring? This was Academy Awards and blah, blah, blah. And then I thought, no wonder it was boring. That was my childhood. My, uh, my mother left. My dad was the full caretaker and he, he played both roles and he was a hundred percent committed to us. And she was, you know, flighty and all that. And yet I, I needed both parents and <laughs> that little boy needed both parents. So no order was more like, duh, you know, uh, and one, of, and one of my favorite movies too. I I'm like boring. What are you talking about? Yeah, that was I, brilliant. I, I should probably watch it again because um, yeah, I remember I remember not liking Mary Poppins the first time because I thought she was controlling and abusive <laughs> because <laughs> she reminded me so much of my surrogate mother who was always trying to get me to do what she wanted. <laughs> and as an adult, I like it now. So, yeah. uh, it's, it's, uh, you, no wonder you like it so much as an adult. You've been trying to get me to watch the returns uh, oh, so many times now, Mary Poppins returns. So greatest um, movie of two years ago, there was a couple of things that he said that, really uh made an impression on me uh sad kid to bad kid yeah you know we tend to see people that are doing bad stuff and bad kids and uh and we we just focus on that moment but it reminded me there's an inner child that was sad and wounded thus became the bad kid uh that that to me was a compassionate thing to say 
uh, he's brilliant. The other thing that, that touched me was he said, we just need to slow down and talk. <laughs> So I want to tell you that that was the next thing I had on my sheet. That was my favorite thing you said. If everyone would just slow down, it's exactly synonymous with, well, how can it not be exactly if it's synonymous? Anyway, <laughs> it's synonymous with what I, I like to be precise with my language, uh, with what I said uh, on an earlier episode um, of, if everybody would just, the first thing you could do is just shut up, shut your effing mouth. I've said that so many times, shut to myself, your effing mouth and listen, slow down. And if everybody did that out there, oh my gosh, and actually listen, you think? What a novel idea. Listen to what someone else is saying and, and hear them. So yeah, um, you made a point. Um, about what was it kramer versus kramer um i can't remember it was it was uh uh something you were just talking about it'll come back to me um i'm glad this isn't a joking around episode i'm, I'm really glad he didn't I, you, you you tried to say something and i tried to say something and and neither of them went over very well <laughs> the one that i tried to say was when he said um it, he said uh the neighbor calling about the next door abuse and then i joked about you calling right. me about angelina and it went over like a led zeppelin yeah. um and he, yeah, he, <laughs> he stayed in his lane you know because that's that's the kind did. of and responsible pretty, adult <laughs> right and i'm glad what he said you know we can all relate to children because we all were children and we were all raised by people i loved what he said that and i so badly wanted to say as opposed to Tarzan, who was raised by wolves, or that new that U two song on that free album we all were forced to listen to that guy came on our iPods, <laughs> raised by wolves. So yeah, this was not the episode um, to to joke about. So I want to talk about the questions that we asked before the episode. We put them out on our Facebook page and our Facebook group. By the way, we have a new Facebook group. It's also called the Purple Evolution, and we'll get more information to you on that soon. But it is a Facebook group. We would love you to join it. And we asked a few questions on them. I went to Dave first before I put these questions up, and I said, should I ask these questions? Or am I poking a hornet's nest that shouldn't be poked? And his answer was poke poke please poke away there are no wrong answers when it comes to our experiences as children with our children and with government intervention into private families lives and i loved that he said that you know he wasn't trying to you know protect his little nest he's like yeah poke away we all need to hear new sides new ideas but we need to debate more we need to get these conversations going um, and I also wanted to mention, he, he talked a little bit about um, documentaries that are out there, and there are a few that, that he and I have spoken about, and I, I wanted to mention them. Uh, one of them was something I saw on YouTube. It was called Removed, R-E-M-O-V-E-D, Removed and Removed Part Two. They're both on YouTube. Now, there's not a strong message. It's a story and it's, it'll pull at your heartstrings for sure, but it certainly will get you into the mode of how important it is to have a good foster care system. Um, the one that, that he mentioned directly to me was the trials of Gabriel Fernandez. And I'm telling you right now, it's not for the faint of heart. Mm -hmm. It's on Netflix and uh, six parts, I think. Um, it's not for the faint of heart. It's pretty rough. And, um, you know, it's about child abuse. And it actually reminded me of a situation which I've talked on the podcast about before. Um, because nothing appropriate was done for Gabriel Fernandez, another child ended up uh, being abused that could have not happened if they had taken care of the situation the first time. And my friend's nephew was brutally beaten um, uh, on a college campus um, 
at a frat house and totally unprovoked, just brutally beaten, um, you know, could have had his life taken away from him and at the very least has had many years of his life taken away from him because he's not the same person and he's lost a lot of his faculties because of it. Um, and nothing has happened. This was um, in Tallahassee and uh, there's a lot of cover up that has happened. And there's a lot of people that are in bed with each other. And so nothing has happened. Well, guess what? Another child um, got even more brutally beaten uh, at a fraternity party not long after that. Why? Because my friend's nephew's case wasn't even looked at. And um, so it reminds me of Gabriel Fernandez that, you know, these things are important. They need to happen. They need to happen now. So perhaps that's why Dave is saying, have these conversations. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we did have a couple of mail mm. and I want to do that first because I'm going to do it this time. And then we'll go to your purple award. Uh, let me see if I can find the mail. So here it is. Um, we asked the questions on our YouTube group. Did you find it that the First of all, we said, do you have, or somebody else that you know uh, that was involved in America's foster care system, did you find it divided politically? Was everyone in it for the benefit of the children and the families, even if they disagreed on what it should look like? Uh, if you found it politically divided, what were the heated topics that were divided between the liberals and conservatives, like we talked about in the interview? Uh, and from your experience, how can it be improved? And we got some fabulous responses and I'd like to read two of them. One Great. from kind of each side. Um, the first one was from Noel B and Noel said, we have two foster daughters now grown and on their own doing well. They're our girls. They came to us in 1990 in Virginia. They had the sweetest, most loving and helpful caseworker. We love her, no politics, just love and respect. And then another one came from Daryl B. And this one was kind of from the other perspective. He said, don't believe the false narrative that this is all about saving babies from crackhead moms. Uh, a female in my life has been through this. In this country, your kids can be taken away with no evidence and just an accusation. The system needs a major overhaul. So... For what it's worth, there are that's a good representation of the responses that we got mm. kind of all over the board. Right. Man. Yeah. Yeah. So good feedback. We sure do appreciate everybody um, that chimed in on the subject. So thank you for that. You got a uh, an award winner for us this week? You won! You did it! You did it! I knew you would! I just knew you would! Before that, uh, just an observation that came to me. Um, number one, um, we did an episode on Do You See Color? And when I look at Dave Myers, I have no idea what his race is. I mean, other than I know he's not Asian, <laughs> but but I have no idea, which is cool. It's uh, You don't, don't see that very often. I, I just have no idea. But the other thing is when I listen to him, it's really tough to, to figure out what political color he is. Uh, mm. He said something at the very, very end about um, expecting a country judge to judge him as a weird Californian. And then I went, okay, he, he probably leans blue from that comment. But in general, it would be neat if when we talked about stuff, uh, not that we need to be in the center, but when we talked about stuff, we talked about it uh, at face value and not from a partisan slant and things like that. I just thought that would be kind of cool. Uh, the Purple Evolution Award today, uh, I'm going to give to the American people. And the reason I'm giving that is because uh, I've read some statistics. I've seen it in a few different places, and there will probably be people that will uh, criticize this. But I read between 70 and 75% of Americans are in favor overall with the stimulus bill that just got passed. Now, you wouldn't see that in Congress because it was split completely on partisan lines on the vote in general. 
but the American people, we get 70% of the American people uh, together on anything political these days. And anything. That, that I'll give them a damn, I'll give them a participation award if I have to, you know. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> That's a very uh, liberal thing of you to do. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> cool, cool. Well, what a great day. What a great example. If I could be uh, like Dave Myers, I'd be a better man. Ditto. Yeah. Anything that you'd like to, uh, you want to take us out? Just that we can all do our part and that uh, there's awesome stuff going on. You know, the news is designed to show us the freak show, not the decent quality everyday thing that is happening in a foster care system or whatever. Uh, they're going to show us the big hyperbolic stuff. And just remember that. Uh, watch less news, I would say. Watch more diverse news if you can. And remember that uh, overall, people are decent. That's my theory. And uh, he made me, re he reminded me of that even more. And the sun always shines on the Gator Band. Go Canes. <laughs> Remember, there are good people in the world. If you can't find one, be one. Let's make America civil again. I don't know when they're wrong people. We're all different shades of humanity. I don't know when they're liberal people. I don't know when they're conservative people. We're all different shades of humanity. A liberty and now we. politicians were harmed in the making of this podcast. The Purple Evolution would love to hear from you. Please contact us by visiting thepurpleevolution.org. You can send us an email, post a comment, ask a question, make a recommendation or a critique on our webpage, become a patron, or even shop for Purple Evolution products and gifts from our store. We are just one click away. Thepurpleevolution.org. That's the purple evolution dot o r g. We look forward to your visit.